I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Professor Sir Martin Polyakov, speaking on how technicians built his career. Sir Martin. So, can you, is my microphone working? Yes. Um, so first of all, since I'm the first speaker from the university, I should welcome you here to Nottingham and to say that I hope you will enjoy our campus and the meeting. And also, I perhaps should say what I say to school children when they come to university, the difference between lectures at school and university is that university, you're allowed to laugh. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and it's really depressing. Online presentations never have any jokes. So it's really exciting for me to be talking live. So here's the title of my talk. And I would stress that I wouldn't normally put all this string of titles after my name, but since you need to know what the technicians built, that's why it's there. And I begin by saying a little bit about myself. Um, I was born in London, and my father was Russian, and I went to Westminster School, which is in London, and then I was a student in Cambridge where I did my first degree and PhD, then I moved to the University of Newcastle. Well, it's now called Newcastle University. In those days, it was University of Newcastle-upon-Tyne. And I've been at Nottingham since 1979. And currently, I have the title Research Professor of Chemistry. And I'm working in the area of green chemistry, which I will explain what it is in due course. And, um, the talk is about technicians. So these are some of the technicians that have been in my life. And the ones that are in green are the ones I'm going to mention specifically, but all of them are very important or have been very important to me. So let's begin with my school. I started science when I was 14. In those days, science wasn't for little children. And you can see there's me. And over there is my friend David Newberger, who went on to become <coughs> president of the Supreme Court, though he did study chemistry before he went over into more serious occupations. And um, in our school, we had one technician, I remember, Mr. Watts. Um, I've put him down as Mr. Watts because neither I nor my former chemistry teacher, Tony Roberts, can ever remember hearing his first name. And Mr. Watts taught me how to do glass blowing. I was never very good at glass blowing because even as a schoolboy, my hands shook too much and I ended up with interesting spirals of glass. So do come in. So, and this is a picture of me, age 65, going back to my old school. And the only bit of the chemistry department still there is the prep room. Um, then I went to Cambridge. I was at King's College there. And in my first week, I met Janet, who became my girlfriend and is now my wife. And um, we never went sailing. This was just a nice place for a photo opportunity. And um, the technicians I came into contact with first at university were the teaching technicians. This picture is what is called a vacuum desiccator, where you dry things under vacuum. And the problem is that the lid sometimes sticks after you've dried it, and it's difficult to get off. So I had an inventive thought. I would open the vacuum desiccator with compressed air. 
And this worked really well. There was a loud bang, and the lid came off. <laughs> However, I hadn't thought it through, because once the lid went into the air, there was nothing to support it. So it came down with a big crash and smashed. And, but the technicians were very forgiving, and I wasn't killed, which was perhaps <laughs> surprising. Um, then the technicians had a really nice piece of cloth. Remember, it was in the days of flower power and so on, wrapping up the dry ice. And I can't remember whether they gave it to me or I stole it. But Janet made a tie from me from the cloth that wrapped up the dry ice. And I still have the tie. And I would be wearing it, but it's got a large stain on it. Um, and so then, at the end of my um, <clears throat> three days after graduating, I married Janet. And um, Janet describes this as taking up her appointment as a house technician. And I invited her to come to the lecture, but she said she had more important things to do. Um, and also, in my first week in Cambridge, I met Dr. then Dr. Jim Turner, um, who supervised my PhD. And I'm delighted to say Jim is sitting there. Wave your hand. And perhaps we should give him a round of applause. Um, now, my PhD was on low temperature spectroscopy and photochemistry, chemistry produced by light. And I'm not going to go into the details at all because that doesn't really involve technicians. And there was a technician called Walter, who everybody called Wally, even to his face, and who did rather simple glass blowing. And I needed a piece of glass blowing that he couldn't do, so I made it myself. Um, just for scale, there's a 5P piece and a thripney piece. How many people here can remember a thr thripney piece? So it was worth one and a quarter new pence. And decimalization happened during my PhD. And um, then there was Harry Naylor, the carpenter, who at a crucial time cut a large hole in the teak tabletop so that I could get to the underneath of my spectrometer. And I think he wasn't meant to do this. But on Saturdays, <coughs> Harry worked on the flower stall in Cambridge Market. This is a modern photo, but the flower stall is still in the same place. And every Saturday morning, Janet and I would go to the marketplace, and when the boss wasn't looking, Harry would give us a large bunch of flowers for a shilling, five pence. And this went on throughout my PhD. So we had lovely flowers for the whole PhD. And then there was Maurice Wilkin in the mechanical workshop who built the equipment for my PhD. And here is a picture of the equipment in 1970 took several months to build. And I'm pleased to say the equipment is still in Nottingham and is still working. And here it is photographed in 2019. Because of the pandemic, I haven't photographed it again. But you can see it doesn't look quite the same, but it's still recognizable. Um, if I get out my pointer. Um, Here you can see there is this vertical piece here that is still there. I bought it for 50 pounds in the first few days of my PhD, and it's still working. Um, then Morris was a very keen, I would say, obsessional gardener. 
and he insisted on coming and visiting Janet and me in our house. And this is a modern picture of our house from Google Maps. Um, our house is here, and the conservatory was built since our time. But our garden, you can see, is quite small, or was quite small. There's a car on the same scale. And Morris, I can't remember whether it was half an hour or 40 minutes he took to go around this garden discussing all the plants. And there was a bit of extra time for the front garden, which you can see is even more symbolically small. Um, then this is my PhD thesis. And um, if you look at the acknowledgments, you can see Cambridge in those days was quite posh. The technicians were called assistant staff rather than technicians. And here I have acknowledged, I'm particularly grateful to Mr. M.A. Wilkin Morris and W.A. Watson, Bill Watson, who did the electronics, who wired up the electronic parts of the apparatus. And then Jim, the one sitting here, became professor in Newcastle upon Tyne. And I got a job as so-called research officer and moved to Newcastle with him. And the chief technician, Jim Smith, came down from Newcastle and stayed here at the um, Royal Cambridge Hotel. This, again, is a modern photo, but it hasn't changed much. It's the nearest hotel to the chemistry department in Cambridge. Jim had never stayed at such a hotel, and he got really excited because on the menu was the exotic continental breakfast. And he then got a bread roll and a cup of coffee and was deeply disappointed. <laughs> but he arranged our equipment to be moved to Newcastle. But very sadly, he passed away only a short time after we got to Newcastle. And here's a picture of the chemistry, the inorganic chemistry department, which is the one I worked in in 1974. And you can see there is me with <laughs> hair that is similar but slightly different color. And there are two technicians on the front row. There's um, Linda Cook, who was a specialist in spectroscopy, and also a fanatical Sunderland football supporter. After Sunderland was in the cup final, she was unable to speak the next day because she had shouted so much. Well, the two days later, because the match was on Saturday. And this is Alan Wright, who was a general sort of jobbing technician and a great specialist on Newcastle Brown beer. And um, then next to me was Alec Campbell, and Alec had started at the university as a technician, but when I was there, he taught the entire foundation year in chemistry. This is all the lectures and also demonstrating all the practicals single-handed. But really, what was important to me is that he showed me how to teach. And um, so... Then Morris traveled to Newcastle to see our garden. And you can see this is our garden. It was a bit bigger. But our successor in this house has also built a conservatory. So when Morris came, it was slightly larger. I should say that Janet prevented me inviting Morris to any subsequent moves we made. Um, then there were the workshop technicians, Alan Knox in the white coat and Roland Graham um, in the jumper, who built the apparatus that we used in Newcastle. And here's a picture of our lab in 
1976. And you can see the same trolley, or slightly different trolley, but essentially the same that Morris built, and all sorts of bits of kit. Um, nowadays, such a lab would be arranged somewhat differently, but the spirit would be the same. And then Jim had a big project. Here's a picture of Jim Turner there, um, called the Spin Flip Laser Project, which made the front cover of um, New Scientist. And in the central position was Derek Cooper, our electronics technician at Newcastle. He was really brilliant at building circuits. Sadly, he died of a heart attack. Though it has to be said, he died in some style because he passed away in the ambulance which was carrying the then Minister of Health who was visiting Newcastle to see how the NHS worked. And Neil, uh, um, Derek obligingly passed away in front of him to see the quality of the service. And then, if we go back to the photo, behind me is PhD student Robin Perut, who is now a professor and fellow of the Royal Society. And <clears throat> when Robin finished his PhD, he wrote his thesis. Um, and on the acknowledgement page, he acknowledged he would particularly like to thank Mr. Roland Graham. When this was shown to Roland, Roland burst into tears, said it was the first time a student had thanked him. And this was in 74, I think 1975. And this is a picture of not a very good one because neither Roland nor I are good at selfies, <laughs> taken at 2018 of a selfie of Roland and me. And quite touchingly, this is a picture of Robin, the now professor and fellow of the Royal Society, talking for the first time to Roland since his PhD. And here, Roland is holding a photocopy of the acknowledgement page of Robin's thesis which it honestly has to, makes me admit that both of them had forgotten. But it is nice to see that people stay in contact. And Roland and I have exchanged Christmas cards ever since I left, not, uh, left Newcastle. Um, so <clears throat> in 1979, Jim moved to Nottingham, and I got a job, a lectureship, and moved here with him has to be said, I have never um, applied for a competitive job in my life. Um, and this is me in my office. I had a very small office which needed two blackboards so that the students could write on one and I could write on the other. It's now sadly been demolished, my, the, my original lab. and. Um, this is Kevin, who um, retired in 2018 after 52 years at the university. And he's holding in his hand quite an unusual electrical plug. When we moved to this university, the university was wired up with a different sort of plug and socket from nearly everybody else in the UK which so-called Wilex sockets, you can see the plug looks like this with a round central pin. And so Kevin <coughs> had to change the plugs on all our apparatus. Thankfully, the university has now changed to more modern plugs. <coughs> but there were actually some technical advantages of the Wilex plug. And this here is Arthur Hans, who worked making things. And shortly after I arrived, I had the 
idea that because other universities had better spectrometers, better lasers than we did, I should have a mobile apparatus that we could take to these other places to benefit from their equipment. And I called it the flying displex, like the flying squad, so it went to other places. And Arthur not only built it, but drove us to the places. And here is the flying displex in the um, University of Reading, and with the kit in front, and my <clears throat> former student, Steve Church, who sadly died some years ago. And then this is the um, two members of the electronics team at Nottingham, or then um, Bill Porter, who was enormously right-wing and a staunch um, supporter of the Conservative Club, and Ralph Parsons, who actually did the electronics under um, Bill's supervision. Ralph was a champion rifle shot, and his hobby was shooting. Um, and then, sorry, I'm pressing. There was Brian Case, the photographer in life sciences, who took photographs of our equipment. In 1985, he hit the jackpot and got the front cover on the annual report of the Science and Engineering Research Council, which at that time was the principal funder of science in, or physical sciences in the UK. And the picture is of our student, Rita Macis, who is now a distinguished professor in the United States. In the days before PowerPoint, if we wanted to have colored slides, we had to print negatives here and then color them with a paintbrush and different colored paints. And this was an enormous chore, but was actually quite good because it gave you time to think what you were going to say. And these slides, the negatives were prepared by Fred Whetstone. There's his photo here. And I spent quite a lot of time in the dark room encouraging him to develop the slides, which I had left rather late for the next lecture. And I have a book that Fred gave me called The Railways <coughs> in and around Nottingham. And inside is a letter from him which says, Dear Martin, thank you very much for the kind present of the copy of your father's memoirs. That's my father's memoirs. I hope you get as much interest out of this little book as I have out of your father's memoirs. Every good wish, Fred. And when Fred died, I think in 2012, we created a prize in his memory for an outstanding technician that is awarded every year. And in 2013, it was won by our technician, Mark Geiler, who you can see here. And um, if you look at the photo of our group in 1988, here is Mark, the young Mark in the middle at the front. <coughs> and also in the picture is John Wally, who um, was the first workshop technician that our group employed directly to make equipment for our group. And also in the picture is my colleague, Mike George. He was a student and then became an experimental officer. This is a high-grade technician working with lasers. He's now professor and deputy head of the School of Chemistry so he is effectively my boss. So I'm very proud of him. And about this time, the late 80s, I became fascinated with what are called supercritical fluids. These are gases that are compressed until they're nearly as dense as a liquid. 
There are plenty of seats on this side. Don't be shy. Come across. Go in the posh seats. And um, so I started using these supercritical fluids as solvents for doing chemical reactions. And here's my PhD student, Steve Howdle, working with some of the equipment we invented for supercritical fluids. And he is now pro also professor and head of the School of Chemistry. So he is my boss's boss. And if you look at our the group photo, there's also Mike Healy, who's here. And Mike Healy started off as a um, junior technician. And in my office, I have a book called Ordinary Level Practical Physics. And inside, there is a label saying Laboratory Technician 1. I think this means the grade, not the, that he was the top. Um, and signed Mike with Mike's name. And Mike was the first technician in this university to be awarded a PhD while working as a technician. I believe the university statutes had to be changed to make this possible. And he was the director of the School of Chemistry from 1991 till 2008. And he was a pioneer of what used to be called technology transfer and is now called knowledge exchange. So let me just give you an example of the sort of things that Mike helped me to do. Um, I became interested in the early 1990s with what is called greener chemistry, which is cleaner ways of making chemicals and materials. And the idea is you do something in the lab and then transfer it into industry. And one of the aims of green chemistry was to find cleaner solvents or greener solvents for doing chemical reactions. And so with Mike's help and encouragement, we started working with industry to use supercritical fluids as solvents for hydrogenation, adding hydrogen to carbon compounds. And I won't go through all the details of the equipment, but essentially you mix the hydrogen and what you want to react with high-pressure carbon dioxide. You pass it over a catalyst. The starting material turns into the product, and you release the pressure, and the carbon dioxide goes around. And here was our lab scale reactor. The reactor is just a little tube here, about the same size as the pointer that I'm holding. And it's a continuous process, so material flows through and the product comes out all the time. And this is my then postdoc, Pete License, who is now also a senior professor in the university. And Together with Pete and Mike Healy, we collaborated with a company called Thomas Swan and Co. and built the world's first supercritical um, CO2 chemical plant to make 1,000 tons a year of chemicals. And here you can see the reactor, which is clearly much bigger than the worker that you can see there. And here is Mike Healy together with the, His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent in 2008, when we had our only royal visit to the School of Chemistry, showing this piece of equipment that had been made in our School of Chemistry. And Martin Della, who is the manager of our workshop, showing to the Duke the sorts of things that our technicians can make. And I should say, we still are employing technicians from our research group. And this is our current team, <coughs> Ben Clark, um, Rich Meehan, and Matt McAdam. And you can see here's the workshop 
It's got even bigger and better machines since this photo was taken a few months ago. And we rely on these technicians to make our equipment. So in 2002, my son Simon decided to go to Ethiopia to teach physics as a VSO volunteer. Um, here he is outside his school. And as a result, we began collaborating with Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. And our technician, Mick Cooper, went to Ethiopia several times to train people how to service equipment. You have to realize that well-meaning rich nations sometimes give developing countries like Ethiopia wonderful bits of lab kit, but they don't tell them how to maintain it, how to do the simplest maintenance, changing this, that, and the other. Mick went out and ran classes for technicians from all over Ethiopia, giving them the confidence to um, work on <coughs> these machines. And as a result, he was made an honorary member of the Chemical Society of Ethiopia. <coughs> and in 2018, on his retirement, he won the Fred Whetstone Award. So this brings me on to taking chemistry to the public. And we have a huge tradition here in Nottingham of <coughs> science communication to the public. And it began with Colonel B.D. Shaw, who started lecturing on explosives here in 1928, before any of us were born. And here you can see him in the <coughs> early 1990s, still demonstrating explosives. And our former technician, Jim Gamble, has continued this tradition. And here he is dem demonstrating gunpowder with rather better precautions than B.D. Shaw had. And Jim, as well as being an outstanding technician, was an expert, or still is an expert, on Meccano. And here you can see um, an advertisement for one of his books. And when my children were small, and I had to entertain them at birthday parties, Jim lent me his Meccano robot, which would struggle to walk across the carpet, but really excited the children. And Jim has also maintained the tradition started at BD, by B.D. Shaw of firing a musket across the lecture theater, and, um, which we still do. Um, and it's a very dramatic exp experiment. Jim stands there and fires a candle across the, the lab with an enormous bang. Um, then in 2008, I and some colleagues started making videos with the help of a video journalist, Brady Harron, about the elements, videos for YouTube. And here is our team with Brady, the video um, filmmaker in the middle. And the person I wanted to draw your attention to was here, Neil Barnes. And Neil um, won, and I think he's the only technician to have done so, won the Royal Society of Chemistry Presidential Award in 2016. And here he is with the then Royal Society of Chemistry President, Sir John Holman, actually standing outside this building with his prize certificate. And Sir John, of course, made a speech, and he said, Neil brings together two things that are very important to me personally. The first is technical skills. Skilled technicians are vital for the success of the chemical sciences. 
Neil has shown their importance as a research technician. The second is outreach. As chemists, we all need to do our bit to inspire the next generation of chemical scientists. Neil has helped bring the excitement of chemistry to thousands of young people. So um, I'm now going to show you a little video. I should warn you that there are quite a few flashing pictures. So if you're sensitive to flashing pictures, cover your eyes. It's very short and you can listen to the music. So, can you... So the thing about videos on YouTube is that people make comments about it. And these are two of my favorite comments. The first one said, what we do, would we do without people like Neil? They are the spinal cord of the lab. I forgive the spelling. And the one that I really like and I think is hugely important is, in school, I've been very, very interested in science, especially chemistry. I'm not going to write an essay, but Neil has inspired me to become a lab technician in chemistry. And I think that's a huge achievement by Neil. So, <clears throat> on 28th of February, 2019, the then Minister of Science, um, Chris Skidmore came to visit, and Neil and I did the demonstration. Well, Neil did the demonstration, and I kept the minister happy. And I pointed out that it was 42 years to the day since Neil had started at the university. And the minister said, my God, that was before I was born. And I had this real moment of feeling old because I realized the minister was younger than my children. So my children are older than the then Minister of Science. I don't know how <coughs> old George Freeman is now. Um, I've done a demonstration for him as well. Um, so I wanted to give a huge special thanks to Neil, who sadly can't be here today. And... Um, say that you may have noticed I'm wearing a badge which says, I love technicians. And this is really heartfelt. And Neil is probably, of all the technicians I have spoken about, the one that I've worked together with longest and most closely. But there are all these technicians. And there's only one thing I would really like to say to them all, which is thank you to all of you. And thank you to you for listening. So, ask some questions. Thank you, Sir Martin, for um, a very personal account of, of um, how technicians have influenced your career. Um, and I particularly like some of the archive photos in there. They were wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I think the science community needs to do quite a bit more to raise the profile of technicians. And obviously, speeches like today um, help with that. Um, but there's also 
um, a couple of things that you mentioned within the speech there of um, having awards internally for Technician of the Year. Um, what else do you think the science community should be doing to raise the profile of the technician? Well, I mean, I think there are all sorts of different things. I mean, the, at the most basic level, uh, we as academics have to teach our students that technicians are not servants, but they are part of the team. And also that the technicians have lives of their own and you cannot go to a technician at one minute before five and say, I need this to be done and so on. I think it's important to involve the technicians <coughs> in discussion of how you do the experiments. I think it's important for universities and I mean, technicians, of course, are important in schools, they're important in industry, but my experience has been almost exclusively with universities. I think the universities have to see the technicians as a valuable resource and just as important as the academics mm -hmm. and not something that you can cut all the time. And I think particularly university administrators don't always realize the value of the personal interaction between the scientists and the technicians. And as in all organizations, there is a tendency in universities to centralize facilities to cent so that that personal interaction is often lost. And, but you say that there needs to be recognition, the Royal Society, that's the UK Academy of Sciences, has created the Hawkesby Award, which is for technicians. But I think it has to be borne in mind that there are different sorts of technicians, that all of whom are equally important. Those are supporting te teaching, those who are, in effect, members of re the research team, and also those that are ensuring that the infrastructure works properly, the fume cupboards work pro properly, that there is heating in the buildings and so on. Mm -hmm. And outside the academic community, of course, a whole bunch of technicians working yes. in industry and yes. in other environments. OK, I'm going to go to the audience for some um, questions. I, I, I know it's always difficult to ask the first question, but if someone could put up their hand, that would be brilliant. And please project your voice, um, because there's no roving mic. Any questions? Come on, this is your opportunity to ask Sir Martin a question. You don't often get that opportunity. Second row. Um, so you may not have heard the question at the back, which is, what can universities do to improve the position of technicians within the universities, um, apart from the technician commitment? Um, is that a fair summary of your question? Um, well, I think the first and very important thing is that there is a certain graying of the technician community. And it is important for us to increase the numbers of young people learning to be technicians and or being trained as technicians. And <clears throat> so at the moment, in many parts of the university, the t technicians are quite old. And um, there are people like Kevin, who I showed, who worked for 52 years, who Kevin has now retired. And we need to start people um, starting their career because one of the things that is important is that technicians are, um, if you like, those who hold the corporate memory 
they remember that this thing happened in 1975 and the solution was to climb on the roof and do this or whatever rather than having to discover these things all over again. The same, I think, applies very much in the industry that we are losing the corporate memory of what went wrong. And so um, I think the answer is that we need to train technicians, we need to get staff to value their technicians, and so on. And I think it's also important to realize that there should be a career structure for technicians that doesn't involve them all the time moving from one department to another when they lose the relationships and they don't build up these memories which make their posts so valuable. And I think at that point, I should probably put in a plug for the Science Council's registered science, science technician, which is, is, is designed to support technicians throughout their career. Um, now the seal's been broken on the first question. Does, is there any other questions in the audience? Um, if we go with the lady on the front row. Um, well, these are things that are outside my control and I have no idea how to influence them, though you can argue that if a shortage builds up of technicians, then the salaries that are being offered will have to increase to attract the people that are needed. And it does seem to me that the government apprenticeship scheme is something that could perhaps be directed to um, training the next generation of technicians. And it is really important for everybody to lobby, for you as a technician to lobby via um, Adam's um, Science Council scheme and so on. Talk to your local MP and so on. And eventually, these messages will get across. Thank you for the question. Do you have a question? Yeah, you may have, you may have actually answered that question. I was I going to ask about the apprenticeship scheme, whether you have that in place in, within your department or your university. We 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 recently took on uh, well, we took on an apprenticeship scheme. Me and some colleagues, um, uh, just n nearly three years ago, uh, and it, it's quite. It, what, what you need is you, you need the support of uh, all, all the academics and the management within the faculty or department that's, that's going to take that on. But uh, it, when it works, it works really well. Um, and a lot of the academics were really, really pleased with, with, with how that's gone. Yeah. Um, um, so, but pay is, is another issue yeah. because uh, the text, the, one of our apprentices, he was working way above his grade, and we've had to push, now he's finished his apprenticeship, we're, we're pushing hard that, he'll, that he should be on at least a grade four, but um, I'm just hoping that, that the apprenticeship scheme may be the start of something that's positive. Um, did you hear the question okay at the back? Um, so, what, what organisation do you work for? Uh, the Faculty of Biological Sciences, Leeds University. And, well, I think to answer your question is that as a chemistry professor, I don't have a global view of the apprenticeship across the um, university, but I know that my own school, the School of Chemistry, is um, 
offering a degree apprenticeship in chemistry with people employed in any organization. We have some of, from our own organization, people from industry working effectively one day a week, mostly remotely, but some um, working at um, <coughs> do some practical work to eventually get a degree in chemistry. What I think our degree apprenticeship doesn't offer, and which is offered by the employers, is actually training in the technical skills of whatever job is involved in their company. But I agree that this is something that we should be using. Thank you. Any more questions? We don't have to have all the questions from the front. <laughs> also from the dress circle and so on. So. There's no questions from no, the there, there is a question. Oh, sorry, I didn't notice. Um, a shift of female employees, um, yes, um, because um, when I started in 1979, there were no female academics. In fact, a visiting professor from the university, Joan Mason, went through a door saying academic staff and found herself in the gents' lavatory. Um, and. I don't remember, perhaps Jim can correct me, I don't remember any um, women technicians apart from those in the um, teaching labs. The number of academic staff is now larger. I can't remember the exact number. Um, well, it's got to be larger than zero, but I mean, it's, it's well into double figures, and we have a lot of very good women technicians. But um, I think that this is very important to, um, to ensure diversity in every um, aspect, not only gender, but religion and everything else. And this is coming in universities. And I should say that Nottingham chemistry is um, unique in the country, having the only black chemistry professor in the United Kingdom. Well, we're proud of it, but as a country, we should be deeply ashamed. So, any more questions? Yes. Um, so the, I don't know if you heard that. What qualities do I find that makes a good technician? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Being a nice person, I suppose. The, um, but I have, I mean, I have had to deal or get on with quite awkward technicians. Uh, but eventually their soul melts and all is well. <laughs> but um, I think... Um, I think really the important thing is, is that the scientists, like me, have to treat the technicians as being real people rather than just there to do things for us. And um, do you know to learn about their families, their children, and so on, and understand a bit about their lives, just like they hear about our lives. So, any more questions? Over here. What are you most excited for in the science um, So, the question is what excites me about um, for the future of the science community? Well, there are two things. As Adam said in his introduction, we're faced with um, huge problems facing the whole of society, global warming, um, expanding population, climate change, and <clears throat> then 
those like the um, Russian invasion, which has caused all sorts of tensions. And the scientific community have to be able to respond to that. We have to be extremely responsible, say, in terms of climate change, when talking to young people to stress to them that part of the solution to climate change is in their ideas that they will bring up because my generation has singularly failed to tackle the problem, although we're beginning to, but we haven't solved it. But on the other hand, we mustn't um, <coughs> cause panic. We don't want young people to think the end is nigh, there's just no point in doing anything. On a personal level, I would say that being a scientist, in my experience, a research scientist, is a bit like being a journalist. If you go to a journalist and ask them, what is your most exciting story, they'll say, the one I'm working on now. So I think the research that really excites me is what we're doing at the moment. Of course, I'm proud of the research example that I did with Jim Turner, but that was a long time ago, and so I'm now much more excited by what's going to happen in the next experiment from our students. But I think we need to inspire young people at all levels um, about how they can contribute to science. And I think the important thing about the technician's role is that it allows people who are not academic high flyers, or not necessarily, to see how they can make a really important and valuable contribution, which is just as important as um, having everybody like Einstein. Um, and there are many um, <coughs> very distinguished chemists or scientists, Nobel Prize winners, who were hopeless in the lab, couldn't even remember where they lived, let alone um, anything more practical. So we need to have this range of skills so that we can achieve science in the way we want. So Martin, you mentioned the um, conflict in Ukraine, and um, a lot of laboratories and research groups are facing difficult decisions about um, international relations. Um, not specifically talking about that conflict, but do you think that science rises above geopolitics, or do you think you know, we need to consider that as, an, as part of our ethical uh, framework when considering research? Well, um, I should say that I have strong connections with Russia, and the, my grandfather was... Um, bought, my um, paternal grandfather was born in Ukraine in a town called Kriminchuk, which recently had its oil refinery destroyed by the Russians. I think one has to distinguish between relations with foreign governments and with um, individual um, scientists, though scientists cannot totally avoid being identified with their countries. I spent um, five years of my life as the Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society, sort of ambassador for UK science. And when I was doing this, I was clearly a representative of the United Kingdom. But I'm a very keen um, proponent of what is called science diplomacy. And one of the things that I'm proud of is that while I was Foreign Secretary, I um, brokered a um, collaboration between UK scientists or volcanologists, scientists who study volcanoes, and their opposite numbers in North Korea, because there's a really big volcano in North Korea which may well blow up in the near future and could cause very big um, humanitarian problems. So I think there is an important role for scientists to um, 
communicate between different countries. The Russian invasion has created what certainly for me has been a unique experience in my lifetime. And it is very difficult for um, institutions like this university to decide what would be the correct response. Fortunately, the actions of the various governments has made it impossible at the moment to collaborate with Russia because you cannot travel there. It's almost impossible for Russians to get visas or the other way around. But in the long term, we need to maintain bridges to <coughs> rebuild relations after the um, present situation has gone past. You only have to look at how relations are um, between the UK and Germany compared to what they were in 1945. We have to, as um, humans, learn to live with our um, fellow humans, but on the other hand, we don't have to live with their governments. Well, thank you, Sir Martin, for what was a very heartfelt talk, and it's very interesting to hear a speaker who wears his heart on his sleeve so much. So um, I, if you could all join me in thanking Sir Martin for a wonderful talk.